beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth not. There was a man set from, sent from God, whose name was John. The same came from a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the word, world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to him that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto them, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? <coughs> John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye not know. No, not. He it is who coming after me is before, before me, whose shoes latcheth, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabiah, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is before, before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abhorred upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he who baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abhorred with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. His first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following Jesus findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip finding Nathanael. Nathanael? And saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses is the law, and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and said, 
and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom is no guile. <coughs> Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and saith unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou, thou shalt see greater things than thence. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Uh, let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you've done for this church, and we pray that you could just bless Brother Josh to preach an encouraging message. Amen. 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 <clears throat> In John chapter 1, we find the Creator God here. We find the living Word. We find the light. We find the life of all men. We find that He comes that all men through Him might be saved. There in verse 7. This true light, the light of every man that cometh into the world, the Bible records this of him in verse 11 here. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. The title of the message today, His own received him not. His own received him not. Now it is well understood, as it says in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 24, Jesus said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But here in the context of scriptures, you find in verse 10 it says, He was in, no, in verse 9 at the end it says, the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And then here it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So the overlying portion, the overlying purpose of Christ's coming, though he came unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, was that he would receive his own, and his own was the world. And this is highlighted further. We see John 3, 16, where it said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't say, God so loved Israel, God so loved the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That was for a time the ministry to them. But the end goal was that his own would be received and his own was the world was every man of all nation kindred and tongue Jesus did not then come exclusively for Israel and then leave the rest of the world after come after them as a sort of plan B there is no plan B with God there is no secondary idea with God I believe Paul and I am with Paul when he said these statements I am fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. We see then Christ for a time had the focus upon Israel, but by and large when the commission went forward to his disciples, it was all the world that was to be preached the gospel. Every creature that was to receive the gospel. Go to Acts chapter 3. However, we do notice and we do see even within his disciples a time that was allowed where the earthly ministry of Christ was bar and by and large based and targeted solely on Christ's brethren according to the flesh. Those that were one with Christ, his brethren according to the flesh. In Acts chapter 3, we see Jesus' same love for the brethren after the flesh carried over into his followers for a time. In verse 12 of Acts chapter 3, the Apostle Peter says, Ye men of Israel, he begins his address after the great healing that had been performed by saying, Ye men of Israel, signifying who he is directing these next passages, these next portions of his preaching unto. And he says this, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, the end of his sermon to the people of Israel, he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before you was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall your Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. 
Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold these things. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, In thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, hath, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So here, speaking of Jesus... The apostle says these statements. He says, before, verse 20, was preached unto you. In verse 21, God hath spoken by his holy prophets. Verse 22, Moses truly said, him, this is Jesus, shall ye hear. In verse 24, all the prophets from Samuel likewise foretold. In verse 25, this covenant made with the fathers to the purpose of verse 26, that unto them first having raised Jesus up from the dead, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. But it is contrasted with that blessing as it always does with verse 23 as a curse. And it shall come to pass that every soul, not just the Jewish soul, but every soul which will not hear that prophet, Jesus, shall be destroyed from among the people. So here God sends forth his purpose as he always does. Hey, here's a blessing, people. Here's a curse, people. Yes, for a time he gave it first, as verse 26 says, unto the children of Israel. And they had had many years before that to receive of that same blessing. But he contrasts it with the curse. You may be blessed or you may be cursed. He reached out to his own, according to the flesh, repeatedly, by the word, by the prophets, and gave them the choice. He said, hear or forbear. He said, choose life or choose death. He said, blessing or cursing. He said, receive me or receive me not. The choice is yours. And even today, as in yesteryear, Christ is constantly coming unto his own and consistently his own are receiving him not. He comes with a purpose to a particular person. It was originally the world, but now today through his word, he comes unto his own. He comes to the Christian, whether nominal or zealous believer. He comes to the lost. He comes to his own. He comes to the world with the same message, blessing or a curse, receive me or reject me. The choice is yours. Verse thir or Acts chapter 13, it continues. Acts chapter 13, you can go there. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, it says, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So we see then a very wide gate that goes to destruction. We see Jesus Christ coming to his own, and his own heading towards destruction, despite having the choice to go to the narrow way, which is simply faith and trust in him. Acts chapter 13 the Bible reads in verse 23, Acts chapter 13 and verse 23. This is talking here about David. It says, Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. And this is the same promise that was promised in Abraham, that according to the flesh, that seed would pass through a lineage of men that would eventually bring Christ. And Christ would be a blessing upon the whole world. And those that are in Christ's seed would be those that are in Christ, who have believed on him and trusted him by faith. This is not an according to the flesh kind of salvation. This is not an according to the flesh kind of blessing. It is only in Christ that anyone receives the inheritance of his salvation and of all that is to come because of that. In verse 23, it says again, of this man's seed, talking about David, that Christ would come raised unto Israel. Verse 24, when John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And if, if, you, if you don't understand that term, the baptism of repentance, uh, 19 and verse 4 says this. It says, saying that they should believe on him which should come after. So the baptism of repentance is the preaching that they should believe on him who should come after. John then preaching the coming Christ before the death, burial, and resurrection, that they should believe on Christ. He stepped out in this ministry, and that ministry went to, as it says at the end of verse 24, all 
the people of Israel. And I believe that when they said all the people of the Israel, when the book of Acts records, all of the people of Israel heard this message, the baptism of repentance, that they should believe on he which is to come. They should believe on he which has shoes that John the Baptist admit he's not even worthy to unloose. It meant all of Israel received that. And I don't just have to buy that word all and say all means all, though that's a wise thing to do. Look at verse 25. It says, and as John fulfilled his course, so it was fulfilled, it was completed, his course, his duty, his job to take that message, the preaching of him which was to come, the baptism of repentance, that they should believe all of Israel, he fulfilled that course. And he said, whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to unloose. And the message is plain, is that he that comes after is greater than me. And it is him that you should believe on. And when Christ entered into that garden, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And therefore, I transferring the power unto him and appointing that which was already appointed in eternity past, that Christ was the Savior of the world. This was the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. Verse 26, he continues, the apostle preaching men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. So then here Paul transitions, and now it becomes not just a stock of Abraham sermon, but it comes a whosoever will sermon as he gives it out unto all and opens it to whoever is under the hearing of God's word. As God comes to his own, through the preaching of the word here. We'll see what happens. Verse 27 says, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So again, he is likening what's happening now to the picture of what happened at Jerusalem um, a little while past where Jesus came and the rulers and all they that dwell at Jerusalem knew him not. They did not recognize him. They did not glorify him as God. They did not give him credit as being God due unto his holy name. And they did not also understand the voices of the prophets, though they were preaching and though they were read every single Sunday, the word constantly being sent forth, sent unto his own, sent unto the world. They did not believe it and therefore fulfilled the very word that they didn't believe by condemning him. Now we see here that all the people of Israel, the dwellers of Jerusalem, along with the rulers, hear and condemned Jesus, therefore making the plan complete that whosoever will may come. And this is the gospel being opened up unto the world. Verse 32, the glad tidings then go forth, and we declare unto you glad tidings how that the promise which was made unto the fathers God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, and through th that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which you, you could not be which could not be justified by the law of Moses. So they're justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. So then, all that believe are justified from how many things? All things. Through faith in Christ, you can be justified from all things. And this is not a salvation that was available unto them through the law of Moses. Therefore, he negates it in regard to salvation. Again, drawing to the light that this is an all message. This is for whosoever will. So who Christ is coming to, again, in one portion was his own, the children of Israel according to the flesh. His own receiving him not and condemning him as was preached in verse 38 when he was offered upon the altar, when he was offered upon as the sacrifice nailed to that cross and rose again, right? But then when that closed up, it became an all message and the apostle is now starting to open this up onto the people as he says, by him all that believe are justified from all things by which he could not be justified from the law of Moses. So what good is the law of Moses in the context of this discussion? So this is wonderful. This is a gracious gift opened up unto the whole world and yet it comes with a warning 
Because what we need to look to things in the past as our examples, right? That's why the whole the Old Testament was penned, was that we standing here might see those things, look unto them for an examples, and not fall into the same lust and into the same sins. So he says this in verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Right? We're looking back to the prophets and taking warning of what's being preached. Right? Jesus just opened it up. The apostle preached it. The prophet proclaimed that he has come unto his own. Him, to all that believe, are justified from all things. He is reaching out to his own, to the world at large that he wanted to reach. And here's the warning. It says, Behold, ye despisers, and wander, and perish. For I work a work in your day, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Right? They went from doing carnal ordinances showing forth the Christ that was to come, to the preaching of the gospel, to the preaching of the message, from the voice of the prophet, which was still a ministry in the past, but now negating the Old Testament pictures and prophecies. He says, a man's going to declare it unto you, and take heed, ye despisers. Wander and perish, for I'm working a work in your day. And these are the works of God, right? That ye may believe on him who he hath sent. That's the work of God. And you shall not believe it, though a man declare it unto you. Plainly, the scriptures are coming unto Christ's own, and he is prophesying here, the prophet, in real time, that his own are going to not receive it, or at least they're in danger of it. These then at Antioch are in danger of doing the same thing as their fathers before. Here the word is preached. Here the word goes forth. Here the word comes to his own. Please don't be so quick to negate it. Please don't be so quick to reject it. Why? Because though they are quick to reject it just as fast, there is a group, there is a remnant that is quick to receive it. There is another group with hopes to receive it, waiting in the wings. Verse 42, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, right, their meeting was over, their special appointed time to meet in the synagogue had concluded, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath day. They wanted more. They wanted to hear more of the same preaching. More of the preaching that says, hey, it's a whosoever will gospel. Hey, this is open to the whole world. Hey, I can be saved. What must I be saved? Teach me more of these things. They reach out. And that group, though his own rejected him, the type goes that there is another waiting to receive it. There is a zealous group of people that have heard these truths for the first time that are ready to devour them. Verse 44, And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. What a wonderful thing. He goes in and he preaches this message and he says, Be warned, you've heard this message. You understood it because your fathers have been the ones in which this was propagated through in the course of time. And now it's not the law of Moses that gave that thing. It's faith in Christ that will save you. And the Gentiles say, We need to hear more of this. And they showed it. The whole city showed up. All to hear the word of God. And you would expect the religious to be like, wow, look at all the people in church. You would expect the religious to be like, wow, there's a great revival of the preaching of the word of God. People are hungry and desiring to hear the preaching of the word of God. You would expect them to be excited. But what does it say in verse 45? And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken unto you, but seeing you have put it from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn unto the Gentiles. It was like they had already just preached that same message, that the, the gospel had become an all and everybody, whosoever will may come type of salvation. And they didn't believe the preaching of God's word and they showed it here, didn't they, right? When they showed up to their normal service and they expected to sit in their normal spot and they expected to talk to their normal friends and suddenly the place was packed out. Everyone in the whole city is there and they're grumpy about it. And the first thing that they do is they're filled with envy and they speak against it and they contradict and they blaspheme the religious that hate and despise what had happened. And the Apostle Paul was wise to this. He's like, I just told you this last week exactly what was happening. And now when it happens, you're shocked and you're odd. Why? Because it was needful that the word of God would go to you first, that you would reject it and all these could 
take part of it. You've judged yourself unworthy of everlasting life. You want nothing to do with it? Fine, I go unto the Gentiles. And he makes that plain, that his own received him not. Therefore, now he has a new own. He has a new group called his own, and it's the whole world. And the gospel has been opened up to all of them. Everyone could have been saved from eternity and time past. Anyone could have believed on Christ. But now, the, the mode of salvation is given because God is starting to work in what will be in the last days and that's now there will be a group known as believers on Christ known as Christians who are going to assemble one with another they're going to constitute a church in different localities there's going to be churches all over the world and they're going to be used to take this gospel and they're going to do it by declaring it unto others See, they had always descended on a meeting place. They had always descended on a certain temple at a certain time. And now God has opened it up that whosoever will may come. You know what that means? There's going to be people with different ways of doing things, different cultures that come in, get different peoples that come in, different places in the world. They're going to meet at different times. They're going to meet at different places. They're not going to meet in the same place twice. It was a very confusing thing that was about to happen to them. And the chaos of it all, when the whole people, the multitude descended on this place, was that they were filled with envy because they couldn't draw such a crowd with their traditions and their vain shows in the flesh. So they contradicted and they blasphemed and they hated on the people of God because they rejected God's word. God's word went forth unto these religious fools' lives. They went forth and all they could do was envy the effect of it. So they spoke against it. They contradicted. They blasphemed and the religious fools of today are no different. Now I am understanding and I completely get it. The Bible tells me it's so. That there is going to be unbelievers that mock. There's going to be unbelievers that hate. There's going to be unbelievers that blaspheme, attack, and ridicule the workings of God. But in recent weeks, I have been surprised and personally shocked by what's going on within the context of religious Christian folks. A man, a soon-to-be-retired, soon-to-be-decorated detective, and pastor Grayson Fritz, many of us know him well, stands in his own pulpit, in his own church, and he says, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, especially verse 13, is true. He says, Romans 1 is true. He says, Jude is true. He says, 2 Peter is true. He says, Genesis 19 is true. He says, Judges 19 is true. He says, the whole book of Revelation is true. And according to the Bible, homosexuals are filthy, vile, reprobate dogs who are worthy of death. He stands in his pulpit, in his church, and proclaims this. And in response, the media, as expected, is slandering. And now that big chain restaurant, Cracker Barrel, is barring his church folks from even descending upon there as a break in between soul winning to meet and to recharge and to get refreshments and to eat and to carry on. We expect that from the world, right? We, we expect, of course, yeah, they don't want Christians there. Of course, the media is going to speak ill of us. They're going to do all these things. But this professed Christians to rise in condemnation. To judge the man for his words and to criticize his words. And here, just as it did in the early pages of the New Testament, and just as it did throughout history, the prophet came with the word of God unto God's own. They came unto his own, and his own what? Received it not. The word of God is being thundered, and 90% of professed Christianity is rejecting it by and large. Regarding specifically to this restaurant barring, okay, all the time and in every state of America, you'll have two queers walk into a Christian bakery. Okay, now it sounds like I'm going to tell a joke now, right? But it's not funny. They go in and they want to buy a wedding cake. They want two men on top of the cake instead of a man and a woman, which is right. The baker says, yeah, no thanks. And they come back with lawsuit papers in hand. They sue the bakery. They ruin them. The legal fees destroy them. And like all over the place, this is happening. We know of some that were really high profile uh, cases, but I'm sure the little ones are happening each and every day. They go in and they try to impose their will. And in a free country, the people aren't allowed to decide who they will and who they won't sell to. Shouldn't, as a business owner, I be able to say, no thanks, I'm not going to make that sale. Based on my own religious convictions, based on my own judgment, based on my own wherewithal. I mean, 
I just don't want your money. Can't can I just say that? But no. And here, Cracker Barrel turns the tide, and they turn away soul winners who simply want to get a meal. There was no event planned except for what was happening outside of it, and they caught wind of it, and they said, no, nope, you can't meet here. So when the queers try to sue the cake maker, the Fox Baptists, right, they'll speak up. They'll make their comments. They'll say, oh, this is, this is horrendous. This is awful. But when Cracker Barrel turns away soul winners, in the ultimate picture of hypocrisy, these faux news Baptists condemn the Christians and say, oh, I wouldn't say these types of things. When 15 years ago, these same preachers were thundering these pulpits across, were thundering these messages across their pulpits and getting great applause and accolations. We have it on record, we, you can go listen to it today, that 15 or 20 years ago, Jeff Owens stood and before thousands of hooting and hollering and carrying on independent Baptists at the biggest pulpit in America proclaimed these words. They're vile, they're reprobating, AIDS is a curse sent from God. Woo! Woo! Baptists running in the aisles, just freaking out, loving the preaching. Why isn't he banned from Cracker Barrel? Why? Because that's not popular anymore. Times have changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. I can still yeah. open and see the exact same Leviticus 20.13. The exact same Romans chapter 1. The exact same Genesis 19, Jude 19, Judges 19, 2 Peter. I can open these passages and read them the exact same as they were 15 years ago. The exact same as they were 1,000, 2,000. Through the end of time, as far back as man can even conceive, the Word of God has not changed. But do you know what changed? Jeff Owens changed. Do you know what changed? The independent Baptists changed. The world moved and got more wicked, and the Baptists stayed just as far away from the world as they did. We've done that illustration before, right? If the world is here, and I'm just going to be this unworldly, right? I'm going to be separated from the world. God's over there. Every time the world moves, I move with it. Look, I'm still separate. I'm equally separate. I haven't changed. My standards are this much different from the world. I'm an arm's length from the world. Well, the world gets more wicked. And I keep going with it. And God's way over there wondering, hey, I haven't changed. Why don't you stand with me? That way the world can go into filth and you have not moved. And this is what I plan to do. I plan to do what the Word of God did. It didn't budge. It stayed the same. And yet, Jeff Owens and all of these independent Baptist preachers, all these soft, lame, liberal, watered-down fools have just gotten their theology from Fox News. So as the world moves away, as long as they keep themselves this far away from the world, they feel like they're safe, but they've left the Word of God. They've left off to doing that which is right. The Word came unto them, they received it not. The Word was preached unto Christ's own, and His own received it not. The Word hasn't changed. The preachers have changed. And all of the sissy friends of Jeff Owens have changed. All of these preachers refuse to preach the word. And it would be one thing if they would just shut up and sit in their ivory towers and study and read commentaries and do whatever lame preachers do with their spare time. But they are now thundering from their internet pulpits or whatever, blaspheming and contradicting. If you're going to be lame and liberal, go away. Just out of sight, out of mind, go and like you say you are, just minister unto your little congregation in your massive church building and just do that until you die. But the word came unto them and they received it not. Beware. Beware, Jeff. Acts 13 and verse 40. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which was spoken in the prophets, behold, ye despisers, and wander and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. You do not believe the work, though a man declared it unto you. He took the word of God and he said, all of these passages of scripture are true. And like I said, they've never, they've always been there. They haven't never not been there. Do you know what happens though when you preach a sermon on a topic? You take all of the references that happen throughout the whole of the Bible and you put them together and you proclaim them all at once. That's topical preaching. And so maybe someone's flipping through their Bible reading and they come across Leviticus 20.13 and they just fly right by it. 
But when we take Leviticus 13, we take Judges 19, we take Jude, we take 2 Peter, we mix them all together into a sermon and present them, suddenly it's disgusting and abhorrent unto the wicked. And it's disgusting and abhorrent unto the preachers that used to believe the very words that they are now proclaiming. The word is coming. The word is going to continue to come unto his own. And in envy his own, these independent Baptists are going to continue to do just what the scribes and Pharisees did. Just what these hypocrites did. They're going to speak against it. They're going to contradict it. They're going to blaspheme it. And they're not going to receive it. I'm sick of these lame, limp-wristed preachers. I'm sick of these guys that always want to talk love, 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 and grace, grace, grace. They've gone sissy. They've gone weak. They've gone soft. And I'm tired of it. These Baptists will not stand for the word of God. They stand for the national anthem before they'll stand for the word of God. And I'm sick of it. Jeff Owens, I hit on him a little bit there. Next, this next one. Evangelist Calvin Allen. I don't know if you've heard of him. If you've been around Baptist circles enough, you might have heard of Evangelist Calvin Allen. Alan. Now, I personally take on the title of evangelist for a time. I am learning under the tutelage of a pastor until I will be eventually appointed as a pastor. My ministry is to feed the flock instead of a pastor, basically fulfilling the role. I'm acting the role while I go about and evangelize the world. I preach the gospel. I'm basically an apprentice in the position that I'm currently standing. That's the biblical evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof thy ministry. Pastors were to continue continue doing the work of advantage because that was the primary work. It just was the fact that later the pastor title was appointed unto the same evangelist. They're basically the same job regardless, right? But this evangelist is the type that drives around the country, or probably flies at this point, with three sermons in his pocket, three stories in his mind, and three songs in his heart. And he goes around and he goes from church to church to church to church, and they're not going to know what he preached the week before. Why? Right? He's got that same recycled, regurgitated message. He can just do the same thing week after week. It doesn't even matter because new faces will be there to say, great message, brother. Oh, that really convicted me. Oh, I was down at the altar. Oh, that was a great message, brother. And they love it. They glory in it. They, they soak it up. These are evangelists. They go around selling their CDs. They go around singing songs. They go around collecting paychecks. He says this in Facebook regarding Pastor Fritz. I'll eat there tomorrow if they ban his leader, Stephen Anderson, as well. What this dude said is despicable. His beliefs are warped. And Cracker Barrel is doing what I would do. So this is an independent Baptist preacher. Like I said, he goes and he influences church after church after church after church. And you'll notice right away the first thing, that they will never put pastor rightfully in front of these men's name. It's always Steve or Anderson or Stevie Anderson, or they misspell it. They will never call him Pastor Stephen Anderson. And the same thing directed towards Grace and Fritz, where in complete disrespect, he calls him dude. What this dude said is despicable. This man was a detective for 20 years and faithfully served his community. He has been a pastor for a year and faithfully served his church. And before that, he faithfully served in other churches. And you're going to call him dude. The next thing you'll notice is he said that what he said, and remember, what did, what did he say? What did he say? He said Leviticus 20.13. He said Romans 1. He said Genesis 19. He said Judges 19. He said Jude. He said 2 Peter. He literally could have stood up and just quoted those, and he'd be in the same position. And do you know what they do? They call it despicable, and they call it warped. Despicable and warped is what Calvin Allen said. Calvin Allen. You see the contradicting and blasphemy that was reported amongst the Jews now being portrayed among the independent Baptists? It's the same spirit contradicting and blaspheming the plain word of God as it comes into his own. They receive and not contradict and blaspheme. Third, you'll notice he is standing with a restaurant that stands with homos. What does that mean? Well, okay, if there's like homos here and I'm Cracker Barrel, and as the preacher, I'm like, I'm going to stand with Cracker Barrel. Who am I standing with? Oh. Homos, right? He has decided, rather than standing with the detective, rather than standing with the preacher, rather than standing above all with the word of God, to stand with the restaurant that's standing with the homos. It's proven here. He continues. He says, we've been standing 
talking about him and his buddies, right? We've been standing just because we don't call for the deaths of folk living opposite of Scripture doesn't mean we don't stand. Interesting, call for the death. Isn't that the same terminology that the news keeps using? Fox News keeps saying, Pastor Stephen Anderson called for the death. Pastor Grace Pritz called for the death. Pastor David Burzins called for the death. It's the same terminology, so does it surprise you when the preacher stands up and says, just because I don't call for the death? The exact same terminology. Where do you think he's getting his theology from? Where do you think his mind of what God is comes from? It comes from Fox News. And then, to add insult to injury, he just finished calling Pastor Stephen Anderson Stephen and dude to the decorated detective and preacher. He's going to call the sodomites folk. They're just folk living in ignorance of Scripture. They're just folk living opposite of Scripture. Jeff Owens had it right. They're vile, they're reprobate, and angels are cursed out for God. Amen. We ought to have Honda Homo Day, right? <laughs> he's a redneck, but he's right. And they, right. Bang on! Amen. That was a great sermon. I told him that to his face once. <laughs> great sermon. <clears throat> they're living opposite of Scripture. Just because we don't call for their deaths doesn't mean we don't stand. If you think the men responding haven't stood and paid a price, you don't know us. Now I see the chest puffed up. Like we've paid a price. We've sacrificed. We've, you know, it's like, it's like the it's like the Pharisee. Lord, I thank you that I'm not as these men, as this heathen who who does such and such. I tithe. I give my offerings. I, you know, he's just this Pharisee. He, yeah. But then this, he says, if you think we don't have a paid a price, you don't know us. I have. <laughs> Six or seven in my close family, some of renown that are openly homosexual. They know full well where I stand. And don't we determine where he stands? He stands with Cracker Bell, who stands with the six or seven documented in his family, something that he would puff up as if they're of renown. That's well known, that's special. Lift it up, of importance. Hey, Calvin, dude, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Amen. There is something wrong with you. There is something wrong with this whole picture. Where you have close family, you have family of renown, you have sodomites, and you are deciding to stand with them. Oh, wait, sorry. They know where you stand, so you're going to tell me now that you stand away from them. But you're standing with the institution that stands with them. One point of association, you stand with the Sodomites. And the fact that there's six or seven in your family is astonishing and frightening. You're going to stand with them, dude, but you won't stand with the preacher who is telling the whole world that Leviticus 20.13 says they are worthy of death. You will not stand with the preacher that is standing up and saying exactly what the Bible says with his own commentary to it as preaching is, right? He preaches the verse, tells you what it means. He preaches the verse, tells you what it means, and then applies it to the context of the day in which we are living. You know what the context of Leviticus chapter 20 and 13 is in the day that we are living? Is that if we had a righteous government up the road, they would be trying, they would be Catching, they would be throwing in jail, proving the guilt of the crime, and executing the Jew, the, the just deserved offense would be would speedily be received by them. And what is that? Death. They would be convicted and tried and put to death. And to, and to say anything else is to deny the scripture. To say that that is inhumane, you've just again blasphemed the scripture. Do you think God put out a law that he expected his own people to live by and it wasn't perfect? God specifically said, finding fault with them. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law was perfect, just, 
upright, completely moral, it should be instituted in that way. And if you're going to say somehow that our laws are somehow more righteous than that, you've blasphemed again. So you need to decide, preacher, today, are you going to stand with the Bible or are you going to stand with the institution that stands with the sodomites? Are you going to stand with the word of God or are you going to stand with the six or seven people in your family? And look, just to, just to put the icing on the cake, Look how he ends his post. This guy, Pastor Grace and Fritz, he didn't say that. That's what I added. Out of respect, this guy is no better than a radical imam with what he said. I am not, all caps, standing with that ever, not caps. What a shame. Of course you're not, because you're lukewarm, you're lame, you're liberal. I would be surprised if you're not twice dead. This guy is a microcosm. This is the problem. We're not just picking on Calvin Allen. We're not just picking on Jeff Owens. Actually, I, I love Jeff Owens. I wish he would just go back to preaching like that and not come out with his lame, like, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know what I was saying those many years ago. And, and I, I just, I'm so sorry for the gays. And I advocated killing gays. And, and uh, please forgive me. I wish he would go back to saying they're vile. the reprobate, aids, and cursed separate guys. And preaching the truth. Okay? So I'm just picking on these guys. What I'm pointing out is the, they are a microchasm of the IFB at large. Talk about a great falling away. Talk about the end times. When people that stood on the word of God even 15 years ago shouted and hollered and ran the idols, aisles about this exact... <laughs> ran the aisles. That was, or ran the idols. That was a good, a good little mix up there. <laughs> because that's what they are, right? When you go down and you bow down at your altar... You set up your idol. <clears throat> They're a microchasm, again, of the IFB at large. A great falling away is before us. The only people that were the last stand, the generation before us now, are openly, publicly standing against us. I can show you the text, right? Openly standing against, not us. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with Grace and Fritz. It has nothing to do with Stephen Anderson, the pastors that I'm referring to. It has to do with the Word of God, because all these men do is stand up and say what it says. And I can today stand up and say what the Word says, and I will be in the same category as them. I'm probably not even allowed to go to Cracker Barrel now, too. But that's fine. I don't want to go there anymore. Let them serve their gods. Let them serve their idols. Those gods that they served on the outer side of the flood, those gods that the heathen served, let them serve them, right? Let them keep an arm's length from the heathen, right? Oh, we don't, you know, abortion's bad. Okay, well, well maybe abortion's not so bad. Well, maybe child sacrifice. Maybe Peter Paul's not so bad. Maybe, and then eventually, what are they? They're just, they're just like the world. Like the world was 15 years ago. That's where they stand now. Where they used to stand against homosexuality, now they stand, who knows where they stand? Serve those idols, you serve them on the other side of the flood. As for me and my house, as for me and our church, we will serve the Lord. Damn. As Andrew at the end of this chapter, as Simon, as Philip, as Nathaniel, when Jesus came unto them and bid the words, come, they received them. They came. They followed him. They joined up with Christ and what he was preaching, what he was teaching, where he was going, where he led, they followed. And I want to be in that rank. I want to be with those men. I want to go with the fathers that were before me that stood against the world as it swayed in the direction of wickedness. I want to stand with Jesus. So when the Bible comes, when the word of God comes unto his own, let's be of those that receive it. Every day Jesus is calling. Every day Jesus gives us the opportunity to hear him speak. We can open up the pages. He is calling each and every one of us to a fight. This fight isn't with flesh and blood. It's against principalities, powers, rules of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the armor every day. Be filled with the armor of God. Study to show yourself approved. Be ready because our armor is of the word of God. Our armor is of the protection of the Holy Spirit. Our weapon is the very words of God. And so people are wondering, they keep saying, well, they're calling for the assassination of the sodomites. They're, they're calling for them to be put to death. Yeah, by the word of God. Amen. According 
into the Bible, the government should do it. And I just proclaim that. <laughs> My sword is a spiritual sword. We will never take up arms against the homeless. We are never going to take these things into our hand. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to say words that make you want to crawl into a safe space. We're going to say words that make you want to cry. We're going to say words that hurt your feelings. And the very words of God are those words that are going to come forth until Jesus comes. Or until you take my head off. Okay? This is the fight that Christians are called to. And we don't need to be mean-spirited. I don't see any mean spirit in the preachers that we're talking about. They're good men. They love their people. They love their families. They love the lost. What can we say about the IFB preachers? You've, you've met them. Half of them love themselves more than anything. <clears throat> so let's be a part. As God calls, we go. As God encourages, we grow. As God strengthens, we preach, and we take the word of God to the houses. We take the word of God to our families. We take the word of God across the pulpits. Whatever opportunity God gives us, we go with the sword in hand, and that's the sword of the Spirit. That's the word of God, and that's how we're going to fight this battle. And if they don't like it, if words are the worst thing in the world, if they're going to be hurt and crushed and offended by it, good riddance, I could care less. The word of God's going to be preached. Do what you will. Man, I wish they'd stand with us. Father, I thank you for this day, God. I pray, God, you would raise up some of these independent Baptist fools sitting in their lazy boys, golfing on the weekends. Give them a heavy dose of your word. They would repent of this wickedness, Lord. And turn back unto you. We need to see a ri- revival, Lord God. And the revival is only going to come because your word is preached. We don't need to sit back. We don't wait. We don't pray for revival. Well, those are good things to do. We don't think that we can twiddle our thumbs and, and you're just going to come in and make everybody saved. Mm-hmm. God, we need to put our hand to the plow and not turn back. That's what I intend to do, God. By your good grace, I pray, God, that you would continue to work in this church. The desire to see your word go forth. The desire to see people get saved. And the desire to see the truth proclaimed without reservation, and without holding back. I pray, God, you continue to work in us. Lord, help us, strengthen us, and guide us unto all truth. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll sing another song, and then we'll get on our way. 255, 255. And stand again, 255. Jesus is bidding. Came unto his own. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. The disciples came to land, trust obeying God's command. For the master called unto them, come and dine. They were found, their hearts desire, bread and fish upon the fire. Thus he satisfies the hungry every time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Soon the lamb will take his bride to be ever at his side. All the hosts of heaven will assemble be. Or it will be a glorious sight, all the saints in spotless white. With the Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table.